Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first Global Population Health Summit, which has been organised in partnership between the King's Fund and NHS England and Improvement. And we really hope this is the start of an ongoing discussion that enables us to collectively learn and improve so that we can support our own local populations. My name is Jackie White. I'm Director of System Development in NHS England and Improvement. And I'm really excited that we're bringing together today a community of people across the world as passionate about this as we are, with that aim of sharing progress, discussing challenges, stimulating action, and hopefully creating an ongoing global network. Before the pandemic, we knew that really only about 20% of a person's health outcomes related to access to good NHS care. But we also knew that we spent about 90% of our NHS budget on just that. And we know that we often treated people's non-clinical problems with medical treatments. We also knew that health inequalities were worsening. As a result of the pandemic, it's even more critical that we focus on actions that really address the root causes of poor outcomes, which no one organisation can solve on its own. Here in England, we've recognised the crucial importance of partnerships across the NHS and with wider public sector services. And we've been developing integrated care systems across the country with that core purpose of improving population health. Population health management we see as a really core function for integrated care systems. The way that we do business across all of those partners to truly enable data-driven decision-making and resource allocation based on current and future population need. And we then can take targeted action to improve what really matters to local people. That's never been more important than right now. We know that the ongoing response, recovery and reset from the pandemic for services, the workforce and the local population are dependent on meaningful and impactful care and support. I'd like to introduce you to the co-chair for today, Yvonne Doyle. Yvonne, over to you to provide some introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Jackie, and thank you very much those who are listening in and welcome. And it's, it's wonderful to have you all here uh, from this country and from international, and I hope you get great value from this day. If we ever needed reminding, this year has told us that health is global. Nevertheless, in the presence of a novel virus, we've moved to innovate at a pace that would have taken years to complete. Uh, we've developed some wonderful new developments for health and for health care. And many of these will endure. However, um, these also raise their challenges. Uh, the good innovations include treatments, new ways of diagnosing in the community, of testing, of tracing, uh, and also of delivering healthcare itself through new technologies. Uh, and we have learned a huge amount about how people actually live their lives. And this will be enduring knowledge for the public health system uh, as we go into the future. Uh, however, we know also that some of these innovations may themselves aggravate health inequalities. And what we've seen this year, and I'm aware of already you're, you're sending questions in on this, uh, that the COVID itself has cast a long shadow, which may exacerbate inequalities that were pre-existing. And again, we're learning so much more about that and about the underlying fundamental structural inequalities that we will have to address as we go forward. So we therefore need, as we recover, to consider the value of equitable distribution of health itself. Health is itself a value in society that we need to think differently about. And how we can actually measure progress in recovery will be extremely important. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Yvonne. I hope that's provided some helpful introductory um, a helpful introduction today and some scene setting. We're, um, we've got some really great sessions lined up. The first one we're coming to is to share the journey that we've been on in England um, through the Population Health Management Programme. The second session today shares some um, fantastic international examples of progress in um, addressing population health. And the third session today is an opportunity to hear from lots of different perspectives, 
in from different in, from people in different roles about what this all means to them and as Yvonne said how we can both use innovation in how we address population health and how we use population health management to drive innovation so I hope it's going to be a, a really exciting day for you um, and a really informative day to take back some actions that you can take forward locally so without further ado let's kick off with our first session and this, uh, this will be a split session where we will share recorded presentations from our three systems that are sharing their experience today, Lancashire and South Cumbria, Dorset and Surrey Heartlands. We will, after the recordings, come to a live Q&A with um, people from those systems. And we'd like you to submit your questions via Slido. We'll answer as many as possible as we can during that live Q&A, but we also have an opportunity after each of the sessions for ongoing uh, discussion and networking. Um, so you'll be able to equally continue to address um, questions and share your thoughts and comments throughout the day. You should be able to see a box next to the video, which is where you can submit your questions and vote in the polls throughout this session. So without further ado, let's go into our first recording. And as I said, please do send in your questions and we'll come to the live Q&A shortly. Hello, my name is um, Sakthi Karunaniti work as a Director of Public Health for Lancashire, and I'm also a uh, Population Health and Prevention Lead for Lancashire and South Cumbria ICS. Um, I think it is fairly accepted that COVID has posed the biggest challenge that humanity has ever faced in this century, and that applies for Lancashire and South Cumbria as well. Um, and in doing so, um, our understanding of why the ch challenges we face in, in improving population health has been um, very uh, illuminating as we went through the population health um, program with NHS England. And it's very clear that there is an imbalance between um, individuals and how we live our lives and society and the rules that we form and the resources that we use and the way in which we use, and of course, the natural and built environment. So right from the word go, for us, is understanding that the interaction between those three leading to economic injustice, as well as ill health and unhealthy environments. That is where we started. And clearly when it comes to improving population health, we've experienced that there is a gap between expectation and reality. Expectation of what we do should lead to reduction in inequalities and reduction um, use of resources. Um, and the actual reality where um, the the health outcomes are actually starting to worsen and more more importantly the uh, collateral damage that we, we probably have done um, due to lockdown and so on to the economy is going to last uh, w longer with its structural inequalities in our society so that's what we're facing uh, when it comes to population health improvement and clearly um, our understanding has uh, led to the balance of both cognition and emotion. And by that, I mean uh, our understanding and our thinking about health and the cause and effect. And it is not all about downstream clinical interventions, um, as well as our emotional readiness in terms of leadership and resilience and patients to wait longer for health improvement outcomes and so on. That too have become a really important contributing factors. So therefore, what does it take uh, in improving population health in uh, Lancashire and South Cumbria in our experience? The first one is really developing the art of understanding of what drives um, health and well-being in our, uh, in our communities, particularly using data and intelligence to drive actionable insights. And I just want to stress that as much as it's about clinical insights and clinical leadership, it's also about financial insights and financial leadership. That I think is the added value um, and the lens that we've um, we've discovered through through this journey. Uh, and uh, the second one really is reaching beyond the walls of the NHS hospitals and GP practices into wider communities and dare I say all the government sectors that are acting national and local, and and particularly in terms of empowering our communities 
and connecting the resources from the national to the neighborhoods. That has been a core part of our journey so far. So in summary, um, improving population health really requires a good understanding of the ends that we are here to achieve. And it is both an operational art and the operational science of improving health using various disciplines um, in health and beyond health and also data as well as communities uh, being empowered. Thank you. Thank you, Sakthi. My name is Declan Hadley. I'm the digital lead for Lancashire and South Cumbria Integrated Care System. Uh, my involvement in the Accelerator program and more recently in response to COVID has been to orchestrate and manage elements of the data infrastructure and to build capabilities um, in actionable insights that Sackley has alluded to. Our journey for us as a system was certainly expedited prior to COVID with the Population Health Management Accelerator Programme. We were one of the first wave to go through that and that undoubtedly gave us a great deal of insight and understanding. Probably got us a little bit match ready for what we were about to to experience through COVID, but actually since COVID, the, the pace of development and learning has been quite phenomenal. We started, this diagram that's on the screen now is something that Sakthi and I pulled together um, right at the start of the outbreak, but really still stands today in how might we bring together data and use data to address need at all levels within the community. Um, right from those that are, are, are very, you know, potentially seriously at risk of COVID for various clinical reasons through to the general well-being of the population. Now, we probably haven't got all of those things nailed down, but what we've learned over the last few months is by looking wider and further, and particularly with our uh, borough councils, we've been able to draw in a wider range of data that's absolutely been truly uh, game-changing in our understanding of what, what the needs are within a community. Um, it also helps us address the equity bias and understands how we may learn to target those people who are most at need within our community and aren't currently accessing services. More recently, we've been using the learning and the development and bringing together this data to create an approach um, for how we manage the day-to-day -day delivery of our COVID response. This complicated diagram on, 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 the, on the screen now shows how we are bringing, with, with the support of our directors of public health, we've brought all of our COVID results data into one place. Now that's allowed us to manage the, the outbreak um, in, a, in a really kind of proactive way, but also use those data to, to help target interventions. So this is something that we're currently working on now, how we've got this risk stratified uh, view of the population. We know who's been infected, who's been tested, and what we are able to do because we've built these capabilities is target our interventions to those most people at need and most people at risk within a community. Some of that includes automation of processes, which is helping us manage, particularly in the last few weeks, some of the really kind of challenging circumstances that we found ourselves. It's been a huge learning journey and we continue to learn. I still think the areas that we need to develop are how we use actionable insight on the front line in a very busy and challenging environment. And that's our next step of the journey. Thank you. Thank you, Declan and Sakthi for setting the scene. Um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about the intervention side of population health. So um, being able to use that data to support people um, and particular to support people with some of the um, more social and, and wider determinant issues. So my name is Linda Vernon. I lead the Digital Empower the Person and Personalised Care work streams at Lancashire and South Cumbria Integrated Care System. Um, the reason I want to talk about digital inclusion today is because it's so important um, in relation to health inequalities. Um, so we know that probably around 20% of the population of the country either do not have the skills to access digital devices um, or do not access the internet. And those very groups that are more likely to be digitally excluded are also more likely to be at risk of other wider health inequalities. So in particular, older people um, over, over the age of 75, um, approximately half of 
the population don't have the basic digital skills um, or access to technology. Uh, people in lower income groups or people who are unemployed and living in social housing. Um, people with disabilities are less likely to access the internet as are people with less um, educational qualifications. Um, people living in rural areas or indeed the homeless um, or people who do not speak English as their, their primary language. And um, the population health management work has helped us to identify and to segment these populations more easily. But one of the things we're not collecting at the moment uh, in a systematic way, but we're starting to, is uh, information about digital inclusion. Um, particularly of importance because of the phase three uh, COVID response, where we're starting to digitally redesign and digitally enable our, our clinical pathways but also to support prevention um, and access to mental health services, primary care services, and things like NHS 1-1 online, um, but recognising that a significant amount of the population won't be able to do so. Um, the uh, digital inclusion has also been recognised as part of the um, Northwest COVID Community Risk Reduction Framework. As a, as a key player and key factor in, uh, in, in reducing the risk of COVID. So in health, um, we recognise that um, even among people who do access the internet, use for health and for accessing healthcare, uh, whether that's transacting with services, whether it's um, accessing information about health and care online, or whether it's um, looking for services that might support people to stay well and support self-management is actually quite low. So on average, only 13% of internet users in the ONS uh, survey reported ever making an appointment with a healthcare practitioner online. Now we're a little bit higher in Lancashire and South Cumbria. We've got about 23% of our, of our public accessing um, GP appointments online, even though 100% are enabled. So we really not need to start supporting people to use digital services to support healthcare better. So this is our uh, strategic approach to digital inclusion, which we've been developing in collaboration with a lot of uh, our public sector partners across libraries, um, adult learning services, our local government, as well as our health and care partners. Um, and really what we're doing is we're trying to support uh, people in a really strategic way to access devices and connectivity, which is really around uh, the financial aspects of, of um, digital inclusion, being able to afford the resources. And there's been some great work going on, um, particularly in light of the COVID response, uh, to support people to access devices and connectivity. But really, the, the, a big challenge is about the cultural issues around digital activation. So giving people the knowledge, skills and confidence to use digital tools and helping to support them with their digital health literacy. So the uh, ease of access to resources and people's understanding of the digital tools that are available to support them to manage their health and well-being. Um, underpinning that is uh, us being able to identify the people who are most at risk of digital exclusion. Um, and we've started to do some uh, significant work, particularly with our district council um, and county council colleagues to try and help to uh, map our digital exclusion across the region and to use that data as part of our population health management approach. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Karen Kirkham. I'm a GP and clinical lead for the Dorset Integrated Care System. In our system, we have 18 primary care networks covering a population of around 810,000 people with 80 GP practices. System working has been a strength of ours through our formation as, a, as an ICS, and now we are embedding population health management as a key plank and golden thread through all that we do. Just want to give some highlights of what we have noticed in the last two years of embedding this program within Dorset. We've really seen system working at its very best, driving integration and workforce planning at every stage. We've solved some really difficult, wicked issues around the data, starting to bring proper linked data sets with a single view of the truth that we can all sign up to and all work towards and understand the needs of our population. We're truly trying to work from system to person, looking at not only what we need to at a whole system level, but bringing that down to place and making real impact for individual people with a real focus on how we can use the data to form our insights and to form real tangible change for patients. 
we all need to think about what we're doing in the time that we're delivering this. And COVID has really impacted on the way that we need to, to, to look at the care of our population. So we're starting with a real focus now and a lens on inequality to bring in a, a, a real unified approach on this. Developing clinical leadership has been outstanding in our Dorset system and is a, a key element to driving change and embedding this as a process through which we all sign up to and make it core part and parcel of making it mainstream, making it stick, developing true collaboration and new, partnership, new partnerships, driving down inequalities and really making sure that we can mainstream everything that we do. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Karen, and hello, everyone. I'm James Woodland. I'm Deputy Director of Business Intelligence in the Integrated Care System. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes and a couple of slides introducing you to the Dorset Intelligence and Insight Service, DICE for short, which is the data management and analytics platform developed in Dorset to support population health management. The DICE is an Azure data warehouse with a Power BI front end. You can see the amount of data being consumed by the DICE, which is on a daily basis, automated, sometimes hourly, um, all pseudonymized at source. The data store is based on the primary care person record and is designed to be used at system and place, neighborhood levels, but also all the tools have the functionality to seamlessly re-identify patient lists to support targeting and case finding. The next slide. Uh, a couple of examples of population health analytics and tools that have been developed within the DICE. These tools have been co-designed with clinical teams to truly open up the right data to better understand our communities and populations. There are tools, a wide range of tools focusing on mental health, depression, dementia, diabetes, COPD, frailty, hypertension and various others, high intensity users. Um, the, the data within here has both physical markers, mental health markers, alongside socioeconomic markers. We've built in a, the suite of John Hopkins risk, risk stratification algorithms into the tool, but also alongside segmentation, theograph you can see on the screen, alongside that ability to re-identify patient lists to support MDT, social prescribing efforts, etc. This slide is a couple of recent examples that the, the DICE have developed, which demonstrate how the data within the system can be used to support all levels of the integrated care system to understand health inequalities. Um, the, this example is flu, we'll also be developing something similar for the mass vaccination program. And how do we identify and truly target vulnerable groups within Dorset? And last from me, these tools were designed <coughs> In Dorset, um, and the platform has enabled a rapid response in putting the right data in the right place, supporting the emergency response and decision makings at all levels of the integrated care system in Dorset. So that's it from me. Thank you, James. My name's um, Dr. Simon Yuan. I'm a GP in rural North Dorset. So my population health journey really started uh, when we worked with Optum as part of the NHS England Wave 1 pilot for population health management. Um, we had some funding to develop a new community frailty team, um, but we wanted to look at how we could develop their working in a more proactive and holistic manner, as opposed to the reactive historical way the teams had been working previously in other areas. We um, worked with Optum and it, it created time for us to get curious about data um, and it created a real energy in the room. So we learned about segmentation, intersegmental drift, uh, retrograde analysis. I can't tell you, it was, it was really quite an exciting experience. You can see from this table, perhaps it's very small, but no surprises, the more complex and frail patients get, the more cost and burden there is to the system. So we designed the personalized care, care plans approach with our frailty team. And we, we could actually see and demonstrate that we could reduce frailty scores and improve um, their well-being and independence. This created a real job satisfaction for our team. Um, next slide. 
So moving on, um, I'm afraid that obviously COVID's put a halt to that face-to-face -face work. So we started to, to look at how we could use our workforce differently. We knew that with all the tragedy, actually the one positive that had come out of this horrible experience was the, the, the recognition for social prescribing and volunteering. And it made us think about our community offer. So we worked with DICE to look at specific cohorts um, that are more at risk from COVID due to long-term conditions, uh, mental health and social vulnerability, and also serious risk of illness. And these numbers, when we segmented them down using the data, were not huge, and we felt that we were able to design interventions to tar target specific groups of our population. To do this, we started to look at our whole teams that we had across our network. If I'm honest, um, initially it had been a little bit disjointed. We were really fortunate. We had link workers and health coaches provided by the CCG prior to network development. Alongside that, with network development, we had our additional role social prescribing team, and they were working a little bit in parallel. Also, the health coach role within our practices was perhaps poorly understood and not well utilised. So we sat down with the organisation that um, uh, employed some of these um, people and we did a really big mapping process and we looked at all of the community assets we had available to, to, to offer our patients and how we could really use them to the most effective way. This is by um, focusing on both the proactive approach through the DICE cohorts, but also making sure we also had that reactive offer for people that came into the surgery or through word of mouth needed help. We looked at all the community assets and there really is a huge amount out there. And we also then looked at how we could perhaps start to evaluate some of this, um, this work, because again, it, it's quite soft data, some of the outcomes. So we were looking at PAMs, uh, we are looking at theographs, which we can populate from the dice. And again, there was a huge energy and enthusiasm. We created clinical huddles so that every Tuesday morning we all came together. This game gave us a real team ethos and we were also able to um, share stories, share information and really um, create huge energy. And so, um, thinking just about a few stories, this is just um, a diagram of one of our bespoke targeted interventions. It was a group of low risk of COVID, so there were patients with one long term condition and they were coded as socially vulnerable. And so we uh, got um, our social prescribers to make contact. We preempted the contact through a text so patients knew that they were going to get a call and that they could decline a call if they needed to. From a cohort of 94 patients, you can see that actually 75% of that cohort received a social prescribing intervention, which went on to further support. I can identify a couple of stories very quickly before I finish. One social prescriber made contact with an unknown carer who was absolutely on her knees with her learning disability son who was, at, who was in active addiction. He actually came up on another list and we were then able to talk to him directly and signpost him to the addiction services. So there are just a few stories. It has been a real honour um, to be part of this work, and I shall just finish there and say thank you very much and hand back to my host. Good morning, and thank you for inviting Michelle and I from the Surrey Heartlands Integrated Care System. I'll introduce myself and then ask Michelle to introduce herself before I carry on. So I'm Prabhu Patel, I'm a GP in Surrey and a clinical director for the Care Collaborative Primary Care Network within East Surrey. And I also sit on the Surrey Heartlands ICF, ICS Executive Board as the lead ICS PCN clinical director. Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Boll. I'm the Transformation Programme Manager for Integrated Care and Frailty in the Guildford and Waverley Integrated Care Partnership. Thanks, Michelle. So just to give you a bit of background about Surrey Heartlands, we are a Wave 1 ICS, which now comprises as a single CCG, having merged all four CCGs back in April 2020. We have four integrated care partnerships based on the old CCG footprints, 25 primary care networks, 104 practices, serving a total population of around about 1.2 million residents. So we are one of the Wave 2 population health management programmes um, sites working with Optum 
and we kicked off back in February 2020, but this was paused during the first wave of COVID. However, we have relaunched this year, and the aims are really as before. It's to look at how do we change care delivery whilst advancing our long-term infrastructure and roadmap. So what are our changes for wave two? Well, the main changes since the start of the year are, one, there is an emphasis on supporting recovery, but this also includes hidden harm. So it's not directly related to those affected by COVID. Two, with the availability of Office 365, we now run workshops via MS Teams, which, you know, it's never as good as face-to-face -face contact, but it still provides plenty of tools available to help promote collaboration. And three, and I'll let Michelle talk about this later on, we have in one of our ICPs um, in Guildford and Waverley a place-based action learning set and an enhanced finance package, which is new for the programme. And currently, we are three quarters of the way through the 22-week programme, and we have a strategy in place to roll out the population health management programme across all other 21 primary care networks across Surrey Harders. So we are in week 18 of 22 weeks, and I'd like to give you an example of one of our PCM programmes. So the Red Hill Phoenix network is a neighbouring network of mine in the east part of Surrey. And they've been conducting action learning sets over the past few months and are just beginning to start seeing patients. So we don't have patient outcomes just yet, but they will follow very soon. It is very much a multi-agency approach with colleagues from local authority, voluntary care sectors, CCG, our acute trust, our commissioning colleagues, federations and community providers. And it's really by taking this sort of multi-agency, multidisciplinary approach that we're able to produce an enriched link data set, which looks at all aspects, including those wider determinants of health. So this particular PCN segment, segmented a population based on frailty between the ages of 50 to 64, for folk with increased hypertension, diabetes, cognitive issues, as well as those increased social debt deprived. And really the group's common purpose was to empower this cohort to live healthier lifestyles and reduce their health and care inequalities through a collaborative approach with partners from across the system. So what are the insights from Wave 2? So far, it's demonstrating the value of data and analyst support to empower PCNs um, by using the data to get proactive insights about populations and inequalities rather than using data as a performance stick. It's about integrating teams, which is really what PCNs are all about. And this has allowed participants from all those agencies to sit around the table for the first time and actually develop that common purpose. We've got colleagues from community nurses, acute staff, local authorities, social prescribers, volunteers, all being able to contribute and deliver care. And that's what makes this so special. And in actual fact, what we have found is that partnership working is as important as data, if not more important. But, you know, we still have a long way to go before it becomes business as usual everywhere. So we need to start getting people around the table from the outset rather than it being an afterthought. So just thinking about the evaluation, I think we need to start looking at, you know, looking beyond the health metrics, the physical health metrics, and start considering measures around patient activation, well-being, the wider determinants, and in, and in, in, you know, and reducing inequalities. And that's, you know, that's how we're going to try and work out exactly what impact we are making. And more importantly, how are we going to tap into our community assets? Because they are there and they really do want to be activated. So before I hand over to Michelle, I would like to say that this is the first time, truly is the first time, that we're able to see and understand our population health needs. And it's only with that enriched data can we really and truly start co-designing, co-delivering services, taking that multi-agency, multidisciplinary approach, ensuring that we focus on prevention and proactive care. Over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Pramit. So in Guildford and Waverley, as Pramit mentioned, we've been looking at the place-based action learning set and also the enhanced finance package. And we've pull those both together. So we're looking at care pathways and the implications for finance and contracting alongside each other. 
We've identified a large cohort to focus this work on to look at alternative payment models that help incentivize collaboration and patient outcomes. And that linked to COVID recovery has been our over 65s who are under four or more elective specialties. However, in order for us to work out how we can actually work differently across all our partner organisations. We've taken that down to a smaller cohort to be able to test our hypothesis. Um, and for that, we've looked at the over 75s with the diagnosis of heart failure in one of our primary care networks. We want to move from a reactive, disjointed, high cost crisis management approach um, towards looking after people more proactively to help them live longer and to also enjoy their life um, for longer rather than the sort of um, reactive care and what we've seen from the data, lots of unplanned visits to um, the uh, acute provider. And we also want to use our collective resources more effectively. We want to look at how we can get our um, finance and payment models encouraging us to work together. And we've had some fantastic conversations between our clinical staff and our finance staff. It's early days, but actually we're really seeing the benefit of bringing those, cohort, those two groups of people together. I think looking at this problem through the ICP perspective has enabled us to think about economies of scale whilst also being close enough to the people who are affected by the change and thinking how we can meaningfully bring together all the providers across our system. And by all the providers, I mean primary care, community care, um, our acute provider, as well as the voluntary sector, local authority and our boroughs and our district councils. One of the things that we found most useful is the theograph. And if you look on the next slide, Pramit, for me, thank you, you'll see that this has only at the moment got our health data on it. But even so, it's been amazing at bringing people together. And I've used it a lot to show to people to understand that it's their, their line of the pathway. There's a lot of other things going on around that patient at the same time. And what we're actually doing in our smaller test cohort is we're able to bring in social care data. And quite excitingly, we're working with some of our voluntary sector organisations to see if anybody's also call, calling their helpline um, on a regular basis. So we're getting a real, truly rounded picture of what individuals are, are doing and how they're experiencing the disjointed care that they've currently got and what we want to be able to do and what we hope to be able to see as we move through this journey is that it becomes a lot more joined up a lot more collaborative and actually that people are enjoying their living their life um, rather than spending all their time visiting either the acute or the community provider or being involved with social care so the theographs really helped us come together around the data to help us design our pathways for patients, to improve our pathways for patients. Thank you for listening and I'll hand back now for any questions. Welcome back. I, I hope you enjoyed hearing from the three systems and their journeys so far. This is now your opportunity for some live um, Q&A. Thank you so much for all of the fantastic questions that you've been sharing through Slido. We're going to try and answer as many of them as we can right now, but equally we will try and come back to any that we can't do now. Um, either in terms of responding directly to the questions, but also through the discussion and the, the chat session that we've got coming directly after this, um, this particular session. So I wanted to start off with a first question for all of our systems that has been coming up um, quite, uh, quite strongly around health inequalities and get some practical thoughts from each of you about how, how what health inequalities means for your local communities and how you are practically trying to address um, root causes of, of people's poor outcomes. So Karen, I'm gonna to come to you for Dorset, Sakthi for Lancashire and South Cumbria and Pramit for Surrey. Karen, what's your thoughts? Thank you, uh, Jackie. So uh, there's no question, is there, in any of our, or any doubt in any of our mind that, um, 
the COVID pandemic has really highlighted the issue around um, health inequalities in a population. It's, it's impossible not to focus our attention on that going forward. Um, and I think uh, not just the outcomes around um, the, the disease itself around COVID, but also we're starting to see now the effect uh, on late diagnosis in cancers, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, strokes, um, uh, you know, lack of immunization um, has, has come through really strongly. So um, I think it's time now to uh, for all systems, um, whether at local place or whether at ICS level, to now to start uh, very meaningfully taking a system wide approach to understanding and being curious about their local data. Um, and I think uh, using our intelligence to um, identify where there are those health inequalities and be really determined about what we're going to do about them in, in order to set direction um, and, um, and outcomes that we expect as a result of the, the new direction that we're taking, which will mean new ways of working and will mean new, new relationships to be developed. And I think um, predominantly working with specific population groups um, around planning and the priorities of that work is going to be really important, uh, involving local communities. Um, and thinking about, um, in particular, those groups that we know who are m more disadvantaged. So those living in poverty, of course, but also those people living with learning disability, serious mental illness, um, veterans, ethnic minority groups, um, all of those groups we need to pay very, very special attention to and set very clear commitments. But also probably for the first time, I would say, having a real ambition to close the gap and incentivize the, uh, the actions that we must, um, that we must, must put in place um, to, to affect the health and well-being of those who are most deprived and most vulnerable in our populations. Um, joint planning, not just about health, but including the local authorities, the wider community and voluntary sector. Um, and I think at its best, this will look like a total view on our local economy to drive economic development, which at the heart of it is going to improve the, the, the health and well-being of our total population. So I hope that gives an idea from a, a kind of a, a, a vision in, an interrogation of the data, making some intelligent decisions around that, and then focusing down on populations. But it's much, much wider than health itself. Jackie, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Sakfi. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Mr. Patel, one of our residents in, um, in Lancashire. Um, sole breadwinner, um, not uh, being really caught by regular employment and have had COVID. Uh, full intention to isolate for the entire period, uh, but struggling to make the ends meet uh, and living in a large um, household, uh, which means that there's very likelihood of um, passing it on to, uh, to the rest of the household members as well. As it happens, it did happen, sadly. Um, so you can see a number of factors playing in the quality of housing, the, the ability to actually self-isolate irrespective of um, uh, the intention. All of that uh, means to us that the prescription has got to be much more broader than the testing and the medicines. And the, uh, and the key one is money and pounds. So uh, we, uh, we were fortunate to have some self-isolation payments and we are targeting that to areas where people that need the most. Uh, but also it's about creating the conditions in which people are able to actually follow the advice and adhere to that. So health inequalities in practice, especially during COVID time, has most certainly shone light on a broad range of factors that we need to address. And it remains an end to achieve, but population health management gives us various ways and means to, to achieve that and certainly broaden the set of interventions that um, we have always had, but really brought to the fore of the need to really join them up in a much more person-centered way, community-centered way. Uh, and it is an economic prescription that will ultimately um, reduce health inequalities and no amount of medical interventions will um, uh, will be uh, sufficient. So that's a, a clear understanding that's brought to the surface for us and we continue on that journey. And one more thing I would add is 
the the resources, the agency uh, that's been generated from our voluntary community and faith sector, particularly the faith sector, in giving people the hope and um, and the belief that, irrespective of where where you are, um, it is possible um, that there are still kind people and compassion in the community that keeps some of the lifelines going in our in our society. So those two are the key points for, for me. Thank you, Sakthi. Um, Pramit, how about Surrey? Yeah, no, thank you, Jackie. And um, absolutely everything that Karen and Sakthi both said, you know, it's inequalities was there before COVID. Um, COVID has shone a light on it. Um, and before COVID, what did we think inequalities was? Well, it was um, life expectancy. It was health conditions, access to care, um, you know, levels of experience for residents and care. But having gone through the programme, or we're at the beginning of the programme in Surrey, we, we realised that only 20% of our residents and our citizens' needs are health and, re health and medical related. Um, and that's where we need to th start thinking um, as a, um, as a multi-agency, multidisciplinary team to try and address all those inequalities that have you know, arisen. For example, we've seen over the years inequalities between our gypsy Roman traveller um, communities, our learning disability communities over the years. We know life expectancy is, is, is less for our LD folk than it is for the average, um, average citizen. So how are we as a community going to address those inequalities? And, we have to be mindful that you know there are lots of community sectors out there that are willing to help and that want to help and have actually got a lot more expertise than some of our health sector colleagues. Um, so absolutely, this is a multi-agency, multidisciplinary approach um, to to once and for all addressing those inequalities that are apparent. But as Sakti and um, and Karen have said, COVID has shone a, a major light on it. Thank you, Pramit. A supplementary question to um, people asking about the non-medical intervention, the role of non-NHS um, partners, particularly the voluntary sector, and Sakthi, mm -hmm. you mentioned the importance of faith. Um, how in the three systems are you reacting to the, the non-medical support that people need, uh, understanding what that might be um, and who in your local areas are best placed to support you. Simone, can I come to you first for Dorset? Thank you. So, yeah, I think, um, again, with COVID, it's really highlighted um, the benefit of the voluntary sector and the volunteers nationally. Um, I think, you know, pre-COVID, we were just starting to look at um, what's happened, for example, in Wigan with the Wigan deal, you know, where the, it was about changing conversations with people um, and it was sort of uh, utilising the whole community uh, to create that sense of well-being um, and, um, you know, belonging, which I think, you know, is really important for actually health outcomes. So, again, I think, um, looking at our social prescribing teams and local intelligence about what's out there to support our communities and then actually having that more holistic approach and again that proactive approach moving away from the very reactive paternalistic medicine that we use you know and actually thinking very differently um, it actually people what actually matters to them you know and it, it's sometimes it's really difficult as clinicians to to think so holistically when you're just trained to deliver a medical model of care and I think what I've realised certainly is that, you know, you have to get that holistic approach and it's really, you know, if you haven't got the well-being, if you haven't got the mindset about how to um, manage your medical conditions, then, you know, you're not going to succeed with that individual. So, you know, um, COVID has given us a real opportunity to really um, address how we change healthcare differently, I think. And again, um, in the UK with network development and the additional roles, um, we've got a real opportunity to use a, a widespread of non-clinical interventions. You know, health coaches, for me, I, I never really, if I'm honest, truly understood their role. But now we can get them to check health supporters to change people's mindset and look at that, you know, their health from a whole holistic um, approach. So, uh, yeah, it's been a real opportunity to, to try and change care. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Um, 
Pramit, can I come to you to, uh, there's a specific question for you about patient activation measures and how you uh, are using them now, but how you see them being used in the future to um, potentially accelerate the understanding of both the non-medical support needs, but also what really um, needs to be addressed around health inequalities. So specifically around patient activation measures and how you're using them. Yeah, no, great, really good question, great question, and and I and I suppose um, the the whole focus is really to to start empowering our citizens and our communities to take ownership um, and to really understand what their needs are. Um, and again, going going back to what Simone just said, you know, with with the PCN, the primary care network, additional roles evolving. How do we help? How can we use our health coaches, our wellbeing advisors, our social prescribers to actually help? engage with our communities, engage with those citizens, and be able to sort of be their touch point? If so, if patients or citizens were to know where they are at the moment, what score they are, what are the interventions that we need to do as an MDT to try and increase their scores? And I suppose it's really a case of, um, of A, we need to understand what the baseline is, I suppose, and sorry, we're right at the beginning of the journey. Um, so in terms of what have we implemented, I would say very little at the moment. Um, we're week 18 out of 20 in terms of the wave two program. Um, so again, and it was interrupted by, by COVID of course. Um, but I think what we are, what we're seeing through our MDTs are that there's a willing, there's an understanding, there's a shared purpose that our multi multidisciplinary members want to engage on a one-to-one with those residents, with those citizens and actually be able to empower those individuals to to feel like they can actually find a solution themselves um, and not have to rely heavily on on health um health colleagues so i think that's answered your question jackie in summary we know it's we know we've got to do it we do have a plan of doing it we just have to try and implement it is that okay Thanks, Pramit. Yeah, that's great. Sakthi, I know you've been doing some um, work in Langston, South Cumbria as well on this. Do you want to share anything? Uh, absolutely. I wouldn't repeat what Pramit has already said, uh, but the, uh, uh, the upshot for us in our experience is it's just really uh, moved us from thinking about uh, ICS as an integrated and care system to an intelligent and conscious systems and it really um, helped us understand our understanding and think about our thinking. Um, an example of that would be, if you go back to the basic, particularly during a COVID response, if you go back to the basic needs and meeting the basic needs of our residents, if you're isolating and if you can't go out to get even your shopping done, your food um, um, on the table, you're very li less likely uh, to, to isolate. Um, likewise, um, being connected with others, particularly in some communities, having physical greetings, hugs and handshakes uh, is a fundamental um, need in some communities. And that has been disrupted during COVID and people have been isolated. And um, just learning from our past, how do we understand uh, and think about our thinking and understanding by various sources of information? So this is where we enter into uh, where else can we look for how do we support people and how do we identify those basic needs? So assisted bin collection is a, is a famous example, but there are multiple other examples. And here, here is where um, our uh, district councils, uh, the local authorities uh, working um, in the front line through their hubs, really uh, developing the agency of volunteers, and getting alongside clinicians is a really must-have um, tool in the armory if we are to talk about addressing inequalities at an individual level. So I think this is uh, this has given us um, a chance of viewing ICSs from being an integrated in care system to an intelligent and conscious systems. Thank you, Sakthi. And I think you've just described the importance of that rounded approach to whatever data locally can be brought together and 
clinical risk, social vulnerability, zone confidence to be able to support themselves. So Declan, I'd like to, uh, to, to take that theme and um, ask you about the work that you've been doing in Langston, South Cumbria to, to get that sort of data. So, so what have you used that might be different? Um, how have you brought that together? And then how have you used it with your analytical community so that the analysts with the expertise are, are painted that frontline teams can actually use to take action. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, as a, um, COVID's obviously, like many other people have already stated, had an impact on the things that we've done. It's been a positive benefit, but it's also had issues and created problems for us. We're probably as a system still on the foothills of this mountain of data that we've got um, to understand and use. Um, I'm going to try and cover some of the questions as we work that, that have been polled. Um, more recently, since uh, prior to the beginning of the uh, pandemic, we were looking at an IG model that allowed organizations to work together as a system with a lead organization. The copy arrangements have come in, in the meantime what we've been doing as a result of the pandemic is working with borough councils and many other agencies and including the likes of DWP to try and find out how we could bring together and link data. In one of our regions in West Lanx, we've made really good progress. That progress has been um, characterised by really good relationships between the councils, the, the, the county council, the district council, the health system. Where things are really flying, Jackie, is where we have those strong multidisciplinary relationships in place. What we've found is um, that there's a really, really um, unique data held by the district councils on the wider determinants of data. And I'm sure I don't need to tell the audience that most of the things that affect our health are very little to do with the health system. And actually what we've been able to bring in is things like housing benefits, disability grants that have been collection that Sakthi talked about, all those kind of characteristics. I don't think, I think it's too soon, Jackie, to say we really understand what this data is telling us. And that's gonna be worked through with the primary care teams on the ground. What we, what, what I think we're gonna find is um, something that's very important to me about this equity bias that some of the colleagues on the questions have asked about, where how do we know we're targeting those people most in need? If we just look at health data, we're potentially looking at the people using the health system. But by broader characteristics, broader analysis of those, these other data, we're starting to find people that perhaps should be accessing health services aren't. So there's real value in in exploring these wider determinants data. We're also drawing in, somebody asked about whether we're bringing other types of data. So we're bringing consumer characteristics, the ACORN type data and using that. All of that is building a richer picture. And what we're, what we're focused on, Jackie, is, is more about direct care than it is around secondary uses of these data. So it's really, really focused. And I think part of the reason we've built the collaboration with partners is because we are focusing on people and those individual needs of people. And also as an integrated care system, that data is being designed and constructed from a technical perspective to make it freely available on demand to the people who need that data, regardless of the organization they sit in. Over the longer term, one final point from me, over the longer term, I do think we need to democratize the data that we're putting together. And by that, I mean making it available to communities to empower those communities. Now that would have to be anonymized type data, but if we're linking data and we're bringing it together for a community to understand that community's need, that should be there for that community use to lobby for changes within their community. Thank you. As mentioned earlier, we're at a very early stage in our place-based work in Guildford and Waverley. Um, 
And so but it's absolutely how we look at that data relating to people that is making the difference and gets stakeholders wanting to be part and wanting to be involved. And I think a really good sort of practical example is how we've reached out with our Age UK Surrey colleagues and how they're like, how can we overlay the data that we've got into the data that you've got to give us that broader, richer information and to help identify the people who are calling perhaps some of the non-traditional medical services to find, try and access help and then how we can bring together all those contacts. So I think it's, um, we're taking quite a, um, a sort of what, whatever works approach, I suppose, that says, you know, if it, we can't get it through our formal data sets, how else can we get it and what else is out there to um, to help us on, on how we support our population. And also recognising, and I just wanted to pick up the point that Simone made earlier around what matters to you. And at the, we're very much literally just about to go live with our place-based cohort. And we're very much planning to sort of do a quality improvement type approach at the end of every session and if we find that what somebody identifies as what matters to them and they're not a key partner we need to go out and find that partner um, and find out how we can help um, so it's not saying oh no we don't do that here it's saying like who else in our um, in our system can help us um, and checking in so that we're really using the voice of the people who are in, who our services are wrapped around to actually inform and help us with that. So I suppose it's a ongoing embryonic and organic type of approach to using the data rather than a, a formal traditional approach. Pramit, did you want to add something? I think you're still muted. There's always one, sorry. Um, what I was going to add is is that um, uh, the, the the beauty of, of this program is 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 bringing the data and linking those data sets absolutely. But the actual the actual where the magic is happening is is bringing all those people together um, and actually defining a common purpose. Um, and and that's that's where that's what's been quite enlightening is that we've we all work in our silos in all our organisations. And we all sort of feel we've got the same purpose or we want to create the same purpose. But in actual fact, for the very first time, this is actually allowing all those people to come together as a unit to actually identify what the issues are. What can we do to actually target those, those, those populations and work with them as a team? I think that's the beauty of this program. That's where the, the magic seems to be happening from our point of view. Thanks, Jackie. I think we might have lost Jackie. I think I think Simon wanted to come in. Thank you. Um, I, I was just wanted to really add. Uh, um, thanks, Premier and Michelle. And I think the really important thing for me is that for the first time ever, we can use um, linked data sets to identify those people that don't access the services. You know, the medical model has always been about you know the people that come in to get their flu jabs, the the things that we do to tick the boxes. Whereas by using real time data analytics across the system we can actually reach out to those people that aren't accessing our services and you know that that's been a really exciting opportunity for us and I think using our whole workforce in a more proactive way the, the thing that's really um, been clear to us is that it's given the workforce a, a real sense of um, you know a purpose for, the, for what they're doing as opposed to the sort of you know normal reactive chasing their tails type work so it's been inspirational thank you Just uh, uh, if I could add something again, um, what I have found is the work we did with our population health management accelerator program at the beginning of the last year really put us in a good place for the COVID response this year. Um, the fact that we'd already started to segment and stratify the population 
is really paying dividends now when we're coming towards how do we uh, prioritise things like vaccines, um, how do we manage the COVID ward or pulse oximetry at home. All those things have been really enabled quite quickly because of the foundation work that was done um, during our PHM accelerator programme. I believe we're having technical issues technical. with Jack. Yeah, I um, think so. Unfortunately. But but just just looking at some of the questions, I think there was a question um, which 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 I might take the liberty of trying to answer, if that's okay. On um on what approach did we take within our system on, on which ICPs and PCNs to work with first and to test the approach, and um, we how we, how it worked in Surrey is that we had um, four PCNs across um, across the twenty five. Um, that were our, our wave two pilot sites um, and very very quickly what we've started to do is um, have buddy arrangements so we've got overlap um, with with emerging PCN so um, for example my PCN is, is budding with the wave two site um, and we've got a, pop, a PHM lead within our PCN who's who's observing looking at how the MDTs are coming together with a, with an aim to sort of swiftly help that sort of transition to the next wave um, we've, we've got a, a strategy uh, to have PHM implemented within the next 18 months across the whole of the system um, if I could have it my way I'd love to get it done a lot sooner than that because um, what we're finding is is that um, we have contractually we have certain requirements to, to fulfill and some of those requirements are based on our population health management data sets um, so it's almost we're sort of working back to front in some respects but I think you know 18 months will, will soon fly by um, I'm not sure Michelle did you want to add anything because you guys are also doing a play space where you've got um, all four PCNs working together yeah so I suppose that's um, just we um, I think we were putting um, when the when COVID hit, we'd already started some of the initial conversations um, uh, with the Wave 2 team around what might this look like. Um, and so we, I think the fact that we were constantly um, badgering, saying um, we can see this as an opportunity to help us with our COVID work and with our COVID recovery was probably why one of the reasons why um, Guildford and Waverley was picked um, to take forward with some of the place-based work and I think it's been um, there's a few questions in the chat I'm trying to multitask and failing there's a few questions in in the chat around um, involving the acute trust and looking at resources from the acute and I think that's part of um, so my, my post for example is actually um, funded by the acute and so it's how we're trying to link in with the acute with the looking at the amount of people who have elective activity and how we can look and do that differently within our community as well so we are trying to I'll try and respond to some of those questions when I, in a minute um, but I think it's it has been the strength has been about bringing our acute provider in as well as our primary care networks in our um, in our in our integrated care partnership, our place based work. Jackie, are you back? No, I don't think she is. Does anybody else want to pick up? I, 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 was, I was going to pick up on um, digital inclusion, but first of all, I thought I'd just share a little, a little anecdote. Thank you, Michelle. Session. I hope so. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, Jackie. Can you hear us? I'm not sure Jackie can hear us. Can you hear us now, Jackie? Thanks, Linda. Is that better? We can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Is that can better? you hear us? There's a slight delay, I think, in you. In Me you now. Shall I, shall I carry on, Jackie? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah, so I was just going to share a little anecdote. Um, one of our, our colleagues in Langston, South Cumbria, said that. Um, so sorry, that, everybody. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, when we think about the acronym PHM, 
and we think about the work that we're doing at the moment, um, both with PHM, but also with personalised care, re really new ways of working that are reaching out into our communities that we could uh, we could use PHM to describe purpose, hope and meaning. Uh, and I know pa Pramit touched on purpose earlier. And I think when we think about meaning and what matters to you or, or to the people we serve, as well as to the staff that we serve, I thought that was quite a nice, a nice touch. Um, so, so I think there's a question in the um, slide about digital inclusion and ensuring that we don't widen the health inequalities gap. Um, and I think, I think the bottom line is that we need to start ring fencing some funds for digital inclusion. Um, we need to top slice or bottom slice uh, or slice in the middle and get some funds for every digital transformation program that we um, that we implement and and target some of that towards supporting our communities to to access devices and kit. Um, and I think we need to get better at identifying and targeting the people who are most in need. So we've gotten really good with PHM or we're still developing, but we're getting better at targeting and identifying people who have social needs and clinical needs um, and overlaying those bits of data. But we're not really good enough yet at capturing and then uh, analysing that data in relation to, to people's vulnerabilities. Um, and I know there's some work going on around SNOMED codes in primary care. Um, we're working with our community hubs um, to see what data they're capturing because the, the COVID response hubs have been asking questions about um, about digitally, exclu digitally excluded citizens, but we're not flowing that data in properly yet. So I think we can get better at that. Um, I think we need to recognise that when, when we do target people and identify people, um, everybody's needs are different. Some people will not want to engage with digital at all, and we mustn't leave those people behind. We must make sure that we continue to have non-digital routes to uh, finding information and accessing services. Um, and then there's the sort of two, two remaining groups. There are the people who we possibly could uh, target quite easily with digital tools because perhaps they've got a higher PAM score. So if they're uh, more activated, they may be more likely to self-manage or to manage their wellness and their um, long-term conditions with digital. And then there's the group who are going to need much more support from us in terms of um, accessing devices as well as um, needing support with skills. Uh, and one of the things we've found is we, we've really collaborated around the digital um, activation. So to develop the knowledge, skills and confidence, we've been working really closely with our VCFSE partners, um, our libraries, our adult learning organisations. We're really fortunate to have a well-established digital skills partnership in Lancashire. Um, and we can, you know, we can be partnering up with housing associations and, and our our colleagues across the sectors because often they're most close to the people who are at risk of health inequalities and can help us to identify people more easily. Um, and then it's remembering that, that you know, dig devices doesn't just mean a tablet or a laptop. It can mean a, an Amazon Echo. It can mean a, a fire stick. There are lots of different tools we can give people to help them if they have accessibility issues as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I, don't, I think somebody did... Simone want to come in and yes so thank you Linda I mean I'll, I'll just add to your your response really briefly I think um, you know there is concern about digital activation um, in Dorset we have digital champions um, that are actually employed through the local authorities so we've been able to use those to support um, activation and also our health champions so we work with the All Together Better program you know with collaborative practice and we've got a number of, of patient volunteers that you know are, are very good with their digital um, uh, work so they, they've been supporting patients to onboard for example, with the MyM Health app for COPD. So, so that was just a brief response there. But um, I was just looking in the chat and there was a question, um, how, how do GPs manage to do anything about population health management when they've still got all of the ill people coming through their doors? And you're, you're absolutely right. You know, everybody across the system is time pressured. And I suppose it's how we think differently about using our resources. So, um, you know, again, I, I hark back to in the UK, the additional roles 
So digital care coordinators, um, our health coaches, you know, um, that those are the people that can support the PHM work. You know, they, they can um, be curious with the data. We can talk to them. We can have MDTs as we have MDTs for all sorts of other pieces of our work. So it's just about um, thinking outside of the box, I think, and just tra changing, you know, how, how we view things. And there was another very quick question about um, this all sounds so perfect. How come we don't all know? about it and trust me it's not perfect at all we are we are all at the start of a journey um, and this is about really uh, revolutionizing healthcare to become proactive and it doesn't happen overnight it happens in tiny steps so I can assure you it's not perfect uh, we, we, we're all uh, as Pramit says you know we're on a journey different at different stages but we're by, we're by no way there yet um, but you know this is part of spreading that word and, and making sure that people you know can start to think about working differently. Thank you. Pramit, I think you need to unmute. Sorry, again, that's two strikes. <laughs> um, so, so Simon, you've stolen my thunder. I was going to talk about digital digital champions and um, and and how we how we really start activating our community. Uh, I, I don't like the word assets, but, but everyone uses them. How do we use our community assets? How can we activate our libraries? How can we activate our community centers? How can we make those touch points for our, for our, for our citizens and our, and our residents? Um, and having those digital champions or, 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 um, or digital navigators should hopefully help address that digital exclusion um, agenda, which you know, we, we know the figures, it's 20% across the country. If we carry on focusing on digital, we will just widen the inequalities. And that's the last thing this program should be doing. Um, so absolutely key fundamentals are, yes, we're moving into a digital era, um, but what are we going to do to help support those who are digitally excluded? And that should be part of the, the solution um, after we get the data sets together. I also wanted to just pick up on a question about dentistry. Um, and the question is, do you think the divide between dentistry um, delivery of dentistry and GP services should be ended and I've got a, I've got a lovely example in fact that um, within during the, uh, the, the first wave of COVID um, we invited our hospital dentist um, to join our MDTs for our care home residents um, and it was brilliant because all of a sudden we were able to look about the, well think about the care home residents dentition that may be an issue for why they might not be eating or drinking um, and all of a sudden, you know, if it, it leads to lots of lots of different different things. So as part of restore to those softer signs, um, looking looking at looking for those softer signs in, in care and residents, dentistry is definitely one of them. So if they've got poor dentition, um, that could be the sole reason for why they're not eating and drinking. And that could be another reason for why they then end up becoming dehydrated and ending up in hospital as clinicians, as GPs. I don't know much about dentistry, but dental colleagues know far more than I do. So how do you bring all those skill sets to actually treat the person as a person and not treat the condition on its own? Um, so I just wanted to just to say, absolutely, now is the time to start bringing in together, not just health and non-health, but you know, not just GPs and non-health, but to bring in the wider elements of health, health, community pharmacy, dentistry, optometry, general practice, acute care, community care, all coming together, wrapping, them, wrapping ourselves around our patients um, and giving them that personalised care. I'll be quiet. Just to add to what uh, Pramit has just said, um, there has been a few questions about measurement and what type of measures that we need, might need. Um, the thought there is uh, we need to measure something that binds various sectors together as a joint success. Uh, an example of that uh, would be rather than just measuring the number of children with asthma being admitted to hospital as a metric, if we bring uh, the schools and the housing in the mix, because we know that there are wider determinants that are in play, we could be measuring the number of school days lost in, say, year six pupils and then break it down to so what will work to keep them up uh, um, in school then that brings a number of other um, determinants in play to contribute to that measure. So I think, um, again, we need to, uh, there is a scope for thinking differently about what we measure as a success measure. 
uh, and then break it down to so what will contribute to, to success. Uh, that's uh, that's the question. And there's another question around public health and population health in the rewiring of the ICSs. I think that's an important one. It's both national and a locally significant one as the public health system uh, is undergoing reforms that we really have an opportunity to um, to better connect. Uh, the capabilities and skills and expertise across the NHS, local government and the wider community sector. And I'd include uh, specialist expertise like district councils, which really have the environmental health and housing expertise uh, in that too. Um, thank you. Thanks, Saxby. So, um, I'm sorry, Jackie, we're still having issues with uh, your, your audio. Um, I'm going to, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I just wonder if we could ask each of the panel in turn um, a question about one key enabler that has driven change within your system around this agenda, one key challenge, or one key opportunity. I'm not sure, um, if Karen's here. I think we were due to go on to the last question, my understanding, which was, um, if Karen's not, I can't hear Karen. I don't know if anyone else can. You can. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So, so what, one key um, enabler, one key challenge, one key opportunity in any order, really. Um, I think maybe I'll I'll come to Simon uh, last. Shall I go to Sakpi first, please? Um, of course. I think um, a significant enabler is um, uh, leadership. Uh, leadership, both uh, clinical leadership as well as system leadership and organisational leadership. Um, until and unless we get a conscious um, uh, change in the framing of how we are going to uh, gather uh, various uh, perspectives in improving population health, population health will remain an interesting project. And it can't, we can't afford to have population health as, a, as an interesting project anymore. It needs to be part of the DNA uh, of how public sector uh, in partnership with voluntary and private sector, dare I say, should work. So that is, uh, that and remains a key enabler. Um, a challenge um, is uh, because of our, the, the habits that we've developed uh, and probably over specialized over decades and centuries, um, we need to break out of the habit of when we think about health, we need to stop thinking about pills and prescriptions to uh, start thinking about people and individuals and then the way that we live our lives and the conditions we live. And that habit, breaking out of that habit, uh, takes time. And without leadership and conscious effort, um, it will be hard to um, break the habit. So that is a challenge for us. Um, the opportunity is, as we have gone through um, the pandemic, um, although we have been socially distanced, I think um, it has brought various sectors together much more than uh, we've ever worked together, whether that is organizing food and prescriptions for those that are isolating or people um, working in the communities being jointly uh, looking after individuals at risk. Uh, and therefore, the recovery path out of this pandemic is the best opportunity we have in hand to, um, to level up our society and to improve the health of the uh, poorest the fastest. Uh, and that is a key opportunity in front of us. And we must all embrace that um, uh, with no doubt that only by working together, we can actually move the needles of population health. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Pramit. Yeah, no, thank you, Karen. Um, I think, I think in terms of practical enablers, um, whilst face-to-face -face is ideal and it's gold standard, um, COVID has presented opportunities to, to use other technical platforms as well, um, a lot quicker and more responsive, such as today. Um, you know, this, this, this platform that we're using today, it allows people from all over the world to come and attend um, um, the, the event. So it's really, you know, things like Office 365, Microsoft Teams, whilst yes, absolutely, it hasn't, it doesn't bring people together physically, at least people are able to actually come together on a, on a regular basis, um, which I think is actually key. And I think it's, um, it's, it's understanding what our system's purpose is. And, it, and very clearly, our, 
our system's purpose is really to to improve the health and well-being of our of our patients and our and our residents um and that's not working in silos that's actually working across sectors um and i think it does in exactly you're absolutely right it comes down to you know system leadership and the values and the culture um and if if we truly do want to improve the health and well-being of our of our communities then we need to work as a team and we need to be one team um so really i think um you know my 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 own take home message is the linked data sets are rich they're valuable but it's the next bit is how do we use that data to actually make a difference to our individuals in our own homes and how is it that we can actually not be seen as the blue little square with the white letters in the middle how is it we can see we we can be seen as a community working together um so really that's um that's all i'll say really it's um it's, but it is a journey and it's one we're enjoying. Thank you, Premit, so much. Michelle. So I think Premit's actually, it's like we've rehearsed it, but we honestly haven't. But And I think the for me, the, um, the the sort of key enabler is the data and the bringing, the pe bringing people together. And the opportunity is the enthusiasm that that's generating for people to want to do things differently. And for as exactly as Premit said, it's not just about the health care that we provide, it's how we do things totally differently. And I suppose that the challenge is that how do we demonstrate that how do we show it and how do we show that in perhaps um, some of the non-traditional ways that it's not just about the typical outcome measures that we might be used to be reporting on in health and that we might need to think a bit more creatively to how we demonstrate the impact it's had to our population thank you thank you Michelle Declan You're muted, Declan. Sorry, I thought I clicked that off, but obviously not. Can you hear me now? Um, thanks, Karen. I'm going to talk about the challenge first and then the opportunity. I think the challenge for us in the coming years is going to be moving away or moving beyond dashboards and reports to make data actionable. Um, and it's going to be a very challenging thing to make data actionable because it's not about algorithms or algorithmics, as they would say on the uh, Anton deck, it's it's about people and how they use information. And sometimes, and most clinicians will tell you this, it's the things that aren't said that are as important as the things that are said. So when we look at data, it's the data we don't have and how we move to this actionable data. So I think the challenge is too much data potentially or data that's ignored the opportunity is where we, it's about, it's not a technical problem, it's a people problem. How do we make data actionable? Well, we need to work on the people who use that data, receive that data, process that data, and help them develop the skills and capabilities. And not just within our professional workforce, but in the wider communities to use those data to make positive changes within their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Declan. Thank you so much for that. Linda. Thanks, Karen. Um, I think for me, a big enabler, particularly during COVID, I think it's come to the fore, um, has been collaboration and co-production. I think we are working much better together across sectors than we ever have before. Um, we set up a supported self-management and psychological resilience collaborative early in the pandemic response. And we still get 40 plus partners who join us fortnightly uh, to share learning and to share experience and to share insights across the system. And I, I think that's um, it, it's just it's one of the silver linings in the COVID cloud, really. Um, I think in terms of challenge, uh, I think resource um, for me, it's all about the interventions. And the bottom line is that we have to start to find more resource to support the upstream interventions. Um, we know that um, 
the VCFSE have really stepped up to the, the demands over the last nine, 10 months. Um, but we need to um, you know, be able to make that sustainable. And I suppose in a way that's where the opportunity lies for me. I think instead of thinking of our VCFSE partners as uh, services that we commission, I think there's a big opportunity to, to bring them to the strategic table and let them help us and, and be, be active partners in the, the leadership and, and the change management and the culture management that uh, we need to um, invest in over the next few years. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. And thank you, Karen. Thanks, Linda. And um, uh, I think I would just echo everything that's been said, really. I think um, for me, personally, the key enabler uh, in Dorset is our data analytics tool. You know, um, it, it brings data together from a, a number of different data sets and just being able to get curious with the data and start to ask questions. And um, that's been truly a, a real opportunity as well, I think. Challenges ever, there are more than one, obviously. Um, time, um, you know, uh, some of this work does take time in a busy day as a GP, as, as we've talked about before. And that one team approach that I think Pramit mentioned, you know, well, this needs to be a whole system approach. And we've started at network level, we're reaching out into the systems, and it's how we create that one team approach, a holistic approach, and it's, it's a change in mind. Mindset. And I think that's an opportunity as well to really use our data um, within our systems to really redesign how, how we work with people. You know, it's not about telling people what to do. It's about listening and supporting them uh, to create their own change. So I think it is a real, real opportunity. Thank you. I'll hand back to Karen now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simone. Thanks to everyone for all of your comments. Um, if it's okay, I'll just take one minute before we close just to um, give some of my reflections as well. Um, I hope that's okay. So just reflecting on, on both kind of a, a, a national and a local journey. Uh, a key enabler for me is the development of the relationships and the trust that forms between partners. That can't be underestimated how powerful that is in, in driving change. Um, I think a key challenge is always that of time when there are so many competing um, uh, uh, pulls on everyone's time, but but carving out that time to do something different. Um, and, and I kind of talk about giving the power back to the people in that sense that you bring it down to community level is is uh, is, 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 is is a challenge, but is also a, a key opportunity. And I think the, the, a key opportunity going forward is the way we are now moving into this integrated care system. It does what it says on the tin, which is actually truly now being able to come together and think about how we can make sure that whatever we do, we work together as, as communities um, in its widest sense, uh, which I think could be a, a, real, uh, a real opportunity for us to drive change um, at a faster pace than maybe we have. And I think the programme that is that we've been on, many of us over the, uh, who are on the panel over a period of years has, has been uh, just really pivotal for, for all of us in driving that journey forward. So I can't, um, I think Jackie, I'm gonna call this to a close if that's what, right. apologies from Jackie. This is real live, real world. This is what happens in the world of uh, <laughs> the technology that we use. So sorry, Jackie, but I'm gonna close for you. Um, if that's okay. Uh, I think it's been a great session. Thanks to everybody for um, inputting. Uh, we've tried to answer as many questions as possible. I hope that, um, uh, I, I really hope that everyone has got something out of it. I'm certainly sure that I have. And every time I, I listen to my colleagues and think about the questions that you ask, um, we we really, uh, I really gain something out of it. So thank you for watching. You're reminded that you can watch the session again on demand. Uh, there is a short networking break now. And we encourage you to uh, visit our resources area before our discussion session, which starts in five minutes at 11.30. Thank you all for listening. And thanks to all the panel. And thanks to Jackie. Bye. <laughs>